Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library and I'm here today to read you a book, or to start one at least. As you can see, I've chosen a comfy place in my house to read this book to you and I think that you should do the same thing. Find some place that's comfortable and cozy to settle down and listen for a while. The book that we're starting today is called Witch Witch and it's by Eva Abotson and it's published by Scholastic, who's let us read it to you. We're gonna start right away with chapter one. Chapter one, as soon as he was born, Mr. and Mrs. Kanker knew that their baby was not like other people's children. For one thing, he was born with a full set of teeth and would lie in his pram for hours, chewing huge mutton bones to shreds or snapping at the noses of old ladies foolish enough to kiss him. For another, though he screamed with temper when they changed his nappy, his eyes never filled with tears. Also, and perhaps this was the strangest of all, as soon as they brought him home from the hospital and lit a nice bright fire in the sitting room, the smoke from their chimney began to blow against the wind. For a while, the cankers were puzzled. But as Mr. Kanker said, there is a book for everything if you only know where to look. And one day, he went to the Toddcaster Public Library and began to read. He read and read and read, and what he read most about was about black magic and sorcery and how to tell from a very early age whether someone is going to be a witch or a wizard. After which, he went home and broke the news to Mrs. Kanker. It was a shock, of course. No one likes to think that their baby is going to grow up to be a wizard and a one that does black magic at that. But the Kankers were sensible people. They changed the name, the baby's name from George to Arabin, after a famous and very wicked Persian sorcerer, painted a painting of vampire bats and newt's tongues on his nursery wall, and decided that if he had to grow up to be a wizard, they would see to it that he was a good one. It wasn't easy. Toddcaster, where they lived, was an ordinary town full of ordinary people. Though they encouraged the little airmen to practice as much as possible, it was embarrassing to have their bird bath full of gloomy and lopsided vultures and to have to explain to their neighbors why their apple tree had turned overnight into a blackened stump shaped like a dead man's hand. Just a picture of the vultures. Fortunately, wizards grow up quickly. By the time that he was 15, Araman could take a bus to Toddcaster Common and raise a whirlwind that had every pair of knickers on every washing line in the area flying halfway to Jericho, and soon afterwards he decided to leave home and set up on his own. The search for a new house took many months. Araman didn't want a place that was sunny and cheerful or a place that was near a town, and though he wanted somewhere ruined and desolate, he was fussy about the kind of ghost it had. Never having had a sister, Araman was a little shy with women, and he didn't fancy the idea of a wailing gray lady walking back and forth across his breakfast table while he ate his kippers or a headless nun catching him in his bath. But at last he found Darkington Hall. It was a gray, gloomy, sprawling building about 30 miles from Toddcaster. To the west of the hall was the sinister forest. To the north were bleak and windswept, windswept moors and to the east, the gray, relentless, pounding sea. What's more, the Darkington ghost was a gentleman, and the sort that Airman thought that he could get along well with, Sir Simon Montpelier, who, in the 16th century, had murdered all seven of his wives, and now wandered about groaning with guilt, moaning with misery, and striking his forehead with a plashing sound. And here, Araman lived for many years, blighting and smiting, blasting and weathering, and doing everything he could to keep darkness and sorcery alive in the land. He filled his battlements with screech owls and his cellars with salamanders. He lined the avenue with scorched tree stumps like gallows, and he dug a well up in his courtyard from which brimstone and sulfur oozed horribly. He planted a yew tree maze so complicated and devilish that no one had a hope of coming out alive, and he made the fountains on the terrace run with blood. There was only one thing that he couldn't do. He couldn't raise the ghost of Sir Simon Montpelier. He would have liked to do this. Sir Simon would have been company. But bringing ghosts back to life is the blackest and most difficult magic of all, and even Araman could not manage it. The years passed. Though he seldom left the hall, Araman's fame was spreading. 
People called him Aramin the Awful, Loather of Light, and the Wizard of the North. Stories began to be told about him, how he could make thunder come before lightning, that he was friends with Beelzebub himself, but Aramin just went on working. He had grown to be a tall and handsome man, with dark flashing eyes and a curved nose like the prow of a Viking ship, and a flourishing mustache, but despite his fine looks, he was not at all conceited. In the years that followed, Araman set up a private zoo in which he kept all the nastiest and ugliest animals that he could find. Monkeys with bald faces and blue behinds, camels with sneery lips and lumpy knees, wallabies with feet like railway sleepers that kicked everything in sight. He turned the billiard room into a laboratory in which fiendish things bubbled all day long, giving off appalling smells, and he called in rain clouds from the sea to drip relentlessly onto his roof. Then one day, he woke up feeling completely miserable. He knew he ought to get up and throw someone into his well, or order a stinking emu for his zoo, or mix something poisonous in his laboratory, but he just couldn't face it. Lester, he said to the servant who brought him his breakfast, I feel tired, weary, bored. Lester was an ogre, a huge, slow-moving man with muscles like footballs. Like most ogres, he had only one eye in the middle of his forehead, but so as not to upset people, he wore a black eye patch above it to make people think that he had two. Before he came to be Araman's servant, Lester had been a sword swallower in the fair, and he still liked to gulp down the odd saber or fencing foil. It soothed him. Now he looked anxiously at his master. Uh, do you, sir? Yes, I do. In fact, I don't know if I can go on much longer. I thought I might go away somewhere. Lester, you know, take in a little room at some pretty market town, perhaps, and write a book. The ogre was shocked. But what would happen to blackness and evil, sir? Herman frowned. I don't know, I don't know. I have a duty, I see that. But how long am I supposed to go on like this? How long, Lester? The frown deepened and he waved his arms in desperation. How long? Lester wasn't this stupid kind of ogre who goes around saying fee fo fa fee fi fo fum all the time. So now he looked at his master and said, well, I wouldn't know, sir. Ogres can't tell the future, you know. But fortune tellers can. Why don't you go and have your fortune told? There was a fortune teller where I worked. Esmeralda, they called her. Knew her stuff, she did. So the following week, Araman and Lester drove into Toddcaster to find the fair. They found Esmeralda's, Esmeralda's caravan quite easily. You could tell it from all the other caravans because the people who came out of it looked as though they didn't quite know what had hit them. She tells the truth, explained to Lester, sniffing happily, remembering the fairground smells, fried onions from the hamburger stall, hot engine oil from the bumper cars. None of that garbage about dark strangers and journeys across the sea. Esmer Esmeralda was a frizzy-haired lady in a pink satin blouse. Araman had only left had left off his ma magician's cloak and changed into a gray pinstripe suit, but the look that she gave him was very sharp indeed. For you, it'll be a fiver, she said. Sit down. She pocketed the money and took a swig from a bottle and then began to stare into her crystal ball. She stared for a long time. Then she pushed the ball away and sighed. It's all right, she said. He's coming. Who, said Araman eagerly, who's coming? The new bloke, Esmeralda said, the one that's going to take over for you. Araman looked bewildered. What new bloke? Esmeralda closed her eyes wearily. Do you want me to spell it out for you? She put on a posh voice and droned, Soon there cometh a great new wizard, whose power shall be mightier and darker even than your own. When this great new wizard cometh, you, Araman the Awful, will be able to lay down the burden of darkness and evil which you have carried for so long. She opened her eyes. Got it? She said nastily. Oh, yes. Yes, Araman said happily. I suppose you don't know when he cometh. No, snapped Esmeralda. I don't. Next customer, please. Just after his visit to Esmeralda, Araman was a happy man. 
Just to fill in time, he planted a briar edge, whose thorns oozed blood, ran an oil tanker aground on the cliffs nearby, and invented a new spell for making people's hair fall out. But most of his time he spent by the main gate, watching and waiting for the new wizard to come. It was cold work. Darkington Hall was as far north in England as you could get without bumping into Scotland, and when, after a week, Airman found a chillblain on his left toe, he very sensibly decided to make a wizard watcher. For the wizard watcher's body, he used a sea lion shape, but larger and furrier with a sloping and rather cuddly chest. The watcher had four feet and one tail, but it had three heads, with keen-sighted and beautiful eyes set on short stalks. And every day at sunrise, this gentle and very useful monster would waddle down the avenue, past the blackened trees shaped like gallows, past the oozing well and the devilish maze, and sit in the gateway watching for the wizard. It watched in this way day after day, month after month, year after year. The middle head looking north over the moors, the left head looking west over the forest, and the right head looking east towards the sea. Then, on the 990th day of just sitting there, the wizard watcher lost heart and became gloomy and annoyed. He cometh not from the north, said the middle head, as it had done every day for 989 days. He cometh not from the west, neither, said the left head. Nor from the east doesn't he cometh, said the right head, and our feet are freezing. Our feet are blinking, dropping off, said the left head. There was a pause. You know what I think, said the middle head. I think the old man's been had. You mean there ain't gonna be no new wizard, said the left head. Middle head nodded. This time the pause was a long one. Don't fancy telling him, said the right head at last. Someone's got to, said the middle head. So the monster turned and lumbered back to the hall, where it found Araman in his bedroom, dressing for dinner. Well, he said eagerly, what's the news? The new wizard cometh not from the north, began the middle head patiently. Nor from the west he doesn't cometh, said the left head. And you can forget the east, said the right head, because the new wizard doesn't cometh from there neither. Then, speaking all together, the three heads said bravely, We think you have been taken for a ride. Ehrman stared at them aghast. You can't mean it. It isn't possible. He turned to Lester, who was getting ready to trim his master's mustache. What do you think? The ogre rubbed his forehead under the eye patch and looked worried. I have never known Esmeralda to make a mistake, sir, but it's been a long... He was interrupted by a terrible shriek from Araman, who was just peering forward into the mirror and clutching his head. A white hair, yelled the magician. A white hair in my curse curl. Oh, shades of darkness and perdition, this is the end. His shriek brought Mr. Ledbetter, his secretary, hurrying into the room. Mr. Ledbetter had been born with a small tail, which made him think that he was a demon. This was a silly thing to think, because quite a lot of people have small tails. The Duke of Wellington had one, and had to have a special hole made in a saddle when he rode into battle at Waterloo. But Mr. Ledbetter hadn't known about the Duke of Wellington, and had wasted a whole lot of time trying to rob banks and so on, until he realized that crime really didn't suit him, and he became Araman's secretary instead. Are you all right, sir? he asked anxiously. You seem upset. Upset? I'm finished, devastated. Don't you know what a white hair means? It means old age. It means death. It means the end of wizardry and darkness and doom at Darkington. And where is the new wizard? Where, where, where? The monster sighed. He cometh not from the north, began the middle head wearily. I know he cometh not from the north, you dolt, snapped the great man. That exactly what I am complaining about. What am I going to do? I can't wait forever. Mr. Ledbetter coughed. <clears throat> Have you ever, uh, sir, con considered marriage? There was a sudden flash of fire from Araman's nostrils, and from behind the paneling, Sir Simon gave a gurgling groan. Marriage? Me? Are you out of your mind? 
If you were to marry, sir, it would ensure the succession, said Mr. Ledbetter calmly. What on earth are you talking about? snapped Araman, who was feeling thoroughly miserable and therefore quite cross. He means you could have a wizard baby, sir. Then it could take over from you. A son, you know, said Blaster. Araman was silent. A son. For a moment, he imagined the baby sitting in his pram, a dear little fellow tearing a marrow bone to shreds. Then he flinched. Who would I marry? He muttered miserably. But of course he knew. They all knew. There is only one kind of person a wizard can marry, and that is a witch. Wouldn't be so bad. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad, said the left head encouragingly. Wouldn't be so bad. Bad, yelled Araman. Are you out of your mind? A great black crone with warts and blisters and unmentionable places from crashing about on her broom? You want me to sit opposite of one of those every morning eating my cornflakes? I believe witches have changed since, began Mr. Ledbetter. But Araman wouldn't listen. Running along the quarters in her horrible nightgown, shrieking, getting egg on her whiskers, expecting her pussycat to sleep on the bed, no doubt. She might not ha Every time I went into the kitchen for a snack, she'd be there stirring things in her filthy pot. Rubbishy frog tongues and neat size and all that balderdosh. Never a decent bit of steak in the place, I expect, once she came. But... Cleaning her foul yellow teeth in my wash basin, raged Araman, getting more and more hysterical. Or worse still, not cleaning her foul yellow teeth in my wash basin. She could have her own bathroom, said the middlehead sensibly. But nothing could stop Araman, who stormed and ranted for another ten minutes. Then, turning very suddenly, calm and pale, he said, Very well, I see that it is my duty. A wise decision, sir, said his secretary. How shall I choose, said Araman. His voice was a mere thread. It will have to be a Toddcaster, which I suppose. Otherwise, there's bound to be bad feeling. But how do we decide which which? As to that, sir, said Mr. Ledbetter, I have an idea. Chapter 2. The witches of Toddcaster were preparing for a coven. And they were very much excited. Covens are to witches what the wolf cubs or the brownies are to people. A way of getting together and doing the things that interest them. And this one wasn't going to be just an ordinary coven with feasting and dancing and wickedness. Rumors were going around that a most important announcement would be made. I wonder what it'll be, said Mabel Rack. Some new members, perhaps? We could do with them. This was very true. Toddcaster now had only seven proper witches. If Araman had known what a state witchcraft had gotten in, gotten to in the town of his birth, he would have been even more miserable than he was, but fortunately, he didn't know. By day, Miss Rack was a wet fish shop, uh, kept a wet fish shop, not far from Toddcaster Pier. She was a sea witch and never liked to be too far from the water. Miss Rack's mother, Mrs. Rack, had been a mermaid, and a proper one, who lived on a rock and combed her hair and sang. But sailors had never been lured to their doom by her, partly because she looked like the back end of a bus, and partly because modern ships were so high out of the water that they never even saw her. So one day she had simply waddled out onto the beach at Toddcaster Head with some sovereigns from a sunken galleon and persuaded a plastic surgeon who was on holiday there to operate her on her tail and turn it into two legs. It was from her mother that Mabel Rack had her magic powers. It was from her father, Mr. Rack, that she had the shop. Today she closed the shutters early, put a couple of cod's heads into a paper bag, and set off for her seaside bungalow. She was just turning onto the road when she saw a group of children paddling happily into the surf, said Miss Rack, pursing her lips. She closed her eyes, waved her pa paper bag with the cod's head, and said, said some poetry. Almost at once, a shoal of stinging jellyfish appeared in the water, and the children ran screaming to their mothers. That's better, said Miss Rack. Like most witches, she hated happiness. When she got home, she went straight into her bedroom to change. Covens are like parties. What you wear is important. For this one, 
Mizrak slipped into a purple robe embroidered all over in yellow cross stitch haddocks and fastened her best brooch, best brooch, a single sea slug mounted in plastic, onto the band which kept her frizzy hair in place. Then she went into the bathroom. Come on, dear, she said, bending over the bath. Time to get ready. What lived in Miss Rack's bath was, of course, her familiar. Familiars are the animals that help witches with their magic, and they are exceedingly important. Ms. Rack's familiar was an octopus, a large animal with pale tentacles, suckers which left rings of blood where they had been, and vile red eyes. It was a girl octopus, and its name was Doris. Now don't keep me waiting, dear, said Ms. Rack. She fetched a polyurethane bucket from the bathtub, uh, bathroom cupboard and was trying to stuff Doris inside. Tonight's going to be an important night. But Doris was in a playful mood. As soon as one tentacle was in, another one was out, and it was a rather bedraggled Miss Rack who at last fixed on the lid, loaded the bucket into an old perambulator, and set off for the coven bus. There's a picture of the octopus. Ethel Feedbag's familiar was not an octopus. It was a pig. Ethel was a country witch who lived in a tumble-down cottage on the, in the village that was just to the west of Toddcaster. She was a round-faced, rather simple person who liked to hack at rutabagas with her spade, make parsnip wine, and shovel manure over absolutely everything. And just as people often grow to look like their dogs or the other way around, Ethel had grown to look very much like her pig. Both of them had round pink cheeks and very large behinds. Both of them moved slowly on short, hairy legs and grunted as they went along. And both of them had dun-colored, sleepy little eyes. Ethel had a job at the egg packing station. It was mostly a boring job because the eggs that she packed were mostly rotten anyway, so there was nothing for her to do to make it more wicked. But she filled in by giving the sheep's husk and turning the cows dry as she bicycled home. As for the plants in the hedgerow between the egg packing uh, station and Ethel's cottage, there was scarcely one that wasn't covered in mold or rust or hadn't clusters of greedy aphids sucking at its juices. But tonight, she rode straight home. Ethel was not a snappy dresser, but to make herself smart for the coven, she rubbed down her Wellington boots with a handful of straw and changed her pinafore for a clean one with felt tomatoes, showing felt tomato blight, stitched into the pocket. Then she started looking for something that she could take to eat. There didn't seem to be anything in the kitchen, but on the hearth rug in the living room, she found a dead jackdaw, which had fallen down the chimney. That'll roast a treat, said Ethel, scooping it up. Then she went down to the shed at the bottom of her garden to fetch her pig. Nancy and Nora Shouter were twin witches who worked at Toddcaster Central Station. They were an unusually disagreeable pair who hated passengers, hated each other, and hated trains. As soon as Nancy went to the loudspeaker and announced that the 752 to Edinburgh was approaching platform, na platform 9, Nora rushed to her loudspeaker and cackled into it that the 752 had engine trouble and wouldn't, would be 90 minutes late and that it wouldn't approach platform 9 at all but would come in at platform 5 if they were lucky. So now, when they should have been getting ready for the coven, they were standing in their underclothes in the bedroom of their flat in Station Road, arguing about which of their familiars was which. That is so my chicken, shouted Nora, tugging at the tail feathers of the unfortunate bird. That is not your chicken, shouted Nora. That is your chicken over there. It was a most ridiculous argument. The Shatter twins were identical, with dyed red hair, long noses, and smoke-stained fingertips. They dressed alike and slept in twin beds, and they both had chickens for familiars, which lived in wicker crates beneath their beds. And of course, the chickens were very much alike. Chickens often are fidgety brown birds who would peck your fingers as soon as look at you. But none of this made any difference to the Shouter twins, who went on bickering so long that they were very nearly late for the most important coven of their lives. For many years now, the witches of Toddcaster had met on Windylow Heath, a wild, wuthering sort of place with a few stunted thorn trees, a pond in which a gloomy lady had drowned herself on her wedding's eve, and a single rock on which the ancient druids had done some dreadful deeds. To get there, the witches hired a bus, 
Coven Special, which left the bus depot at 7 p.m. No one had flown on a broomstick since a witch called Mrs. Hawkeridge had been sucked down the ventilation shaft of a Boeing 707 from Heathrow to Istanbul and very nearly caused a nasty mess indeed. The Shouter twins were still quarreling when they got to the depot, but they stopped when they saw standing on the pavement beside the bus a small brown coffee table. It's her again, said Nancy. Silly old crone, said Nora. I've got a good mind to stub my cigarette out on her, said Nancy, who, as usual, had one dangling from her hand. They glared at the squat round table, which seemed to be swaying a little side to side. Tis a pity when they go simple like that, said Ethel Feebag. She had loaded her pig into the trailer and now came over and prodded at the table leg with her Wellington boot. The coffee table was, in fact, a very old witch called Mother Bloodwort who lived in a tumble-down shack near a disused quarry in the poorest part of town. When she was young, Mother Bloodwort had been a formidable witch of the old school, bringing people out in boils, putting the evil eye on butchers who sold her gristly chops, and casting spells on babies and perambulators so that their own mothers didn't know them. But now she was old. Her memory had gone, and like many people who were old, she got fancies. One of her fancies was to turn herself into a coffee table. Mother Bloodwort did not drink coffee, which was far too expensive, and since she lived alone, there was no one who might have wanted to put a cup and saucer down on her. But she was a cranky old witch, and every so often she remembered the spell that changed her from a white-haired, whiskery old woman into a low oak table with carved legs and a glass top, and then there was no stopping her. What she often did not remember how to do was how to turn herself back again. Oh, come along, called Mabel Rack from inside the bus. Leave the silly old thing where she is. From her mermaid mother, Mabel had inherited rather scaly legs that dried out easily and itched, so she wanted to get to Windy Low Heath where the air was damp and cool. But just then, something happened. Two sparrows who'd been squabbling in the gutter lifted their heads and began to sing like nightingales. A flock of golden butterflies appeared from nowhere, and drifted through the and drifting through the grimy bus station came the scent of primroses with the morning dew on them. Ugh! It's her," said Nancy Shouter. "I'm off," and she threw her chicken into the trailer and climbed onto the bus. "Me too," said her twin. "I can't stand her. I don't know why they allow her in the coven. Really, I don't." Belladonna came slowly around the corner. She was a very young witch with thick golden hair in which a short-eared bat hung like a wrinkled little prune. There was usually something in Belladonna's hair. Um, it might be a fledgling blackbird parked there by its mother when, while she went to hunt for worms, a baby squirrel wanting somewhere safe to eat its hazelnuts, or a butterfly who thought that she was a lily or a rose. Belladonna's nose turned up at the end, making a ledge for tired ladybirds to rest on, and she had a high, clear forehead and eyes as blue as periwinkles. But as she came to the bus, she hesitated and looked troubled and sad, for she had learned to expect only unkindness from the other witches. Then she saw the coffee table and forgot her own troubles at once. Oh, poor Mother Bloodwort, have you forgotten the undoing spell again? The table began to rock, and Belladonna put her arms around it. Try to think, she said. I'm sure you can remember. Was it a rhyming spell? The table rocked harder. It was? Well, I'm sure it will come back in a minute. She leaned her cheek against the glass top, sending out healing thoughts into the old witch's tired brain. It's coming back. I can feel it coming back. There is a swishing noise. Belladonna tumbled backwards, and there, standing before her, was an old woman in a long mouse-bitten cloak and felt bedroom slippers with the sides cut out. Thank you, my dear, croaked Mother Bloodwort. You're a kind girl, even if you are. But she couldn't bring herself to say the dreadful word. No black witch can. So she hobbled to the bus and began to heave herself aboard, clutching her to her chest a large square tin showing a picture of Cor King George the sixth coronation on the lid. The tin should have gone in the trailer. There was a rule that all familiars traveled separately, but Mother Bloodwort never let it out of her sight. Inside were hundreds of large white maggots, which, when you blew on them, turned into a cloud of flies. One fly is no good for magic, but a cloud of flies, flies in your hair, your eyes, your nose. 
That makes it good for Mother indeed. Belladonna was the last to get on the bus. She, alone of all the witches, had no familiar. For white magic, you do not need one. It was another thing that made her feel so alone. That's the end of chapter two, so that's where we're going to end today. Thank you for listening. My name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm reading Witch Witch by Eva Abotson, published by Scholastic. Thanks for listening to the first chapter, and we'll see you tomorrow. For the first few chapters, we'll see you tomorrow for the next few. Bye!